Good morning, everyone. Welcome for, to our webinar. You've joined um, in a listen only and watch only mode. You're um, muted at this time. If you have any questions as we go along, please add those in the chat and we'll get to those as we're able. Um, this is being recorded and will be available on our website for viewing in the future and you'll be getting an email with that uh, link to watch. And now we'll start our presentation uh, with some words from Dana Connors. Dana. Thank you, Angie, and also good morning from the State Chamber to all of you. Thanks for being with us. My name is Dana Connors and of the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, and today representing the edu education foundation of our organization. I'm pleased that we're able to partner with Rachel Carestas, uh, the Executive Director of Science Is Us, and together we will be presenting to you today the first in a series of three webinars dealing with the topic, the economics of climate change. I wanna pause for just a moment to be sure that I do not forget the sponsors who make all of this very possible. We, we appreciate very much your support. It truly makes a difference. And as you can see on the screen, it is AARP of Maine, Eaton Peabody, Attorneys at Law, First Light, Kennebec Savings Bank, Delta Dental, and Sun Life. We, again, we thank you. Uh, it truly makes a difference and we appreciate your support. Climate change is not a problem of the future. No, it's a challenge that's with us today and just about every day and for proof. All you have to do is take a moment to look around our country and to take note of this, it appears to be the extreme conditions of today's weather patterns. No, it's not a challenge. And yes, it's here. And it is a challenge, I should say. And yes, it's here. And the question is, what are we doing about it? And what are the challenges? And out of those challenges, are there economic opportunities? Well, I can say uh, that as far as I'm concerned, the Climate Action Plan indicates that something is being done about it. Our state in December of 2020, as I recall, put together a plan with the help of a lot of council members that worked together to put forward a number of strategies and goals that really did take a look and confront the conditions of the climate challenge. In their words, Maine won't wait. And we all know on this issue, we truly can't afford to wait. But what are the impacts that go with this challenge on Maine's economy? Can the challenges that we see and feel before us be turned into opportunities? Well, that's precisely what today's program hopes to answer or at least discuss in more detail. We're gonna begin our presentation today with Jonathan Rubin. Jonathan is an economic professor at the University of Maine, and I believe it's fair to say has a strong leaning and towards the economics of energy and environment. And he was also a member of the council that put together the climate action plan that I just mentioned. He will be followed by Rachel. Rachel will be introducing a panel of three individuals representing our heritage industries those three very important economic sectors of our state that deal with lobstering, that deal with forest products, as well as our hospitality industry. With that, it is my pleasure to present to you, Jonathan Rubin. Dr. Jonathan Rubin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dana. And I, it is my pleasure to be here today. It is, uh, this is a really an important issue. I, I can't overstate that. Um, let's let me just back up from Maine just a little bit to put this in a global perspective because we are part of this global system. Um, since two thousand, the year two thousand twenty-two was the sixth warmest since records have been kept since eighteen eighty, <clears throat> and ten of the warmest years in history that we know of. Uh, recent history, that is. Now, I'm not talking 10,000 years ago, but in recent history, uh, have occurred uh, since 2010. So we know that 
we know that globally this is real, and now I'm going to talk a little bit about Maine. But before I talk about uh, climate change a little bit, let me just be a little careful here. We walk outside, and what's the weather today? Weather, right, this is temperature, precipitation, the winds, how cloudy it is. So weather is what you see on a given day. Climate uh, is really that same, those same variables, but measured and averaged over 30 years at a particular location. So that, with those two sort of clarifying points, let me get to some things we know about Maine and the cost of Maine's economy. First, there, there are three types of costs, and I want to talk about these. One is direct costs, another is costs of adaptation, and the third is mitigation costs. So when I say direct costs, I'm talking about damages to our infrastructure. We're talking about harms to our ecosystems. We're talking about monetary damages that we bear because of climate change. Now, cost of adaptation, this is cost to Maine's households, the state, businesses to adapt, moving homes, hardening infrastructure, bigger culverts. This all We're all adapting, we're spending money, real resources to overcome these things. And finally, it's mitigation costs. So when you're talking about reducing the greenhouse gas emissions that we all produce, that's things we can spend money, say, buy an electric vehicle. I drive an electric vehicle myself. That costs money to buy an electric vehicle. Of course, there are benefits. Fewer maintenance costs, costs less to drive an electric vehicle. But you still have to spend for those costs. We have adaptation costs, direct damages, and mitigation costs. So those there are benefits. We'll get to the benefits in a minute because there's a lot of federal money and very thoughtful state plans on how to spend some of that money as well as state resources to to help Maine's economy. But let's let's talk about what we know about Maine's economy. And I um, I take a lot of these from Maine's climate future, uh, put up our the Climate Change Institute, and that'll, that'll be available. Uh, a link to that will be available after the webinar. Um, so we have instrumented, um, we have measurements from actual instruments for about 140 years in Maine. Uh, so what do we know? We know that in Maine, for the last 100, 125 years, it is the average temperature and averages, you know, it's hard to calculate an average temperature, but it's gone up about 3.2 degrees uh, since then, uh, the last 100 years or so. Um, we know that the uh, greatest warming is occurring in the coastal areas and the coastal locations are seeing greater and more intense storm damages. Uh, we know that the growing season has lengthened about two weeks. And that's right, that is a positive there. I mean, given our climate, Maine's growing season has increased about two weeks, mainly due to later frosts in the fall. Um, we are getting more intense precipitation, especially in coastal areas. So that means that local rivers, streams, uh, they all ultimately flow into the Gulf of Maine. And these can those high intense flows can damage roads, bridges, and properties. Um, high winds are often associated uh, with some of these intense storms and can cause very large damages. So we know that inland, the most occurring, the most warming is occurring in the winter season, uh, with an average winter temperature increasing 3.7 to 4.2 three degrees, and again, I'll refer you to the original sources and the main climate future where I took these numbers from. Um, and we're getting more winter wh whiplash. We saw that this last weekend uh, with this ice pellets and warming and colding. This, this is the new normal. This is not the way it was when I at least grew up here. Um, we know that lakes are experiencing earlier ice out, ranging from one day earlier uh, in Eagle Lake to more than three, three weeks earlier at Worthley Pond in Western Maine. And this is, again, these are measured changes from, uh, from instruments. So this is not, as these are actual measurements. Um, the shorter winters and more extreme rain events are also associated with greater tick and Lyme disease, uh, which again is something that uh, never used to have, up here in Orono, University of Maine, I never used to have ticks. Now I have to be really careful walking around. That has all changed. Rising sea levels. What does this mean? One of the places suffering the most is Portland. We know that Portland, who's had the longest continuous record of measuring um, water levels, that the water levels ra raised seven inches since 1912. And that means that 
with higher sea levels, high tides are causing more frequent what's called sunny day or nuisance flooding. That's when coastal wa waters rise up and exceed two feet above long-term average daily high tides. It used to occur about five times a year. It's now occurring 12 times a year, especially with northeasters. So that is, these are the costs really as measured and the changes as measured uh, that we know for the state of Maine. Now, the latest report, um, uh, as Dana alluded, alluded, alluded to, Maine has, Maine's climate plan, Maine won't wait, uh, put up by the Climate Council, is very ambitious and has a number of very sensible actions that need to be implemented. And implementing them correctly is important. But let me just talk about a couple of the goals. The ambitious goals are that Maine is tasked with reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, to 45% um, to below 2030 emission by, sorry, 45% gross greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 uh, reduction and 80% reduction by 2050. Very ambitious goals. We The good news is we have met shorter term interim goals of a 10% reduction by 2020, and we in fact exceeded that and we've got a 25% reduction of gross emissions. Also, good news is we're on track for a net neutral by 2045, meaning that the emissions we emit are off offset by the emissions it, um, sequestered through larger through forest and also some uh, marine actions through uh, seaweed and, and other uh, ways to uptake using the marine uh, environment. But so that's the good news. 90% of the greenhouse gas emissions net, sorry, gross in the state of Maine are from the energy sector, half of which comes from transportation. So 90% um, a little more than 90% of the gross greenhouse gas emissions come from the energy sector. Half of that is cars, trucks, primarily in Maine, uh, a little bit of marine, some um, air, air emissions but it's mainly cars and trucks and freight. Um, the, uh, the next largest sector is the residential sector, 21%, the uh, commercial sector, 12%, industrial, 12, and electric power sector at five. So we know where these emissions are coming from. We know uh, how to mitigate a lot of these emissions, but it, the question is how to do it fairly and how to advance Maine's business and uh, prosperity and also Make sure that everyday people, especially the more vulnerable people, uh, are not impacted uh, or minimal, minimize the impact of this. And uh, I will ha I'm happy to say that there's an equity subcommittee of the Climate Council that's specifically looking at trying to mitigate uh, being careful about those most vulnerable uh, citizens of, in the state of Maine. There is a lot of money flowing down from the federal government and, and some state resources to address these. Uh, in particular, um, Maine is expected, Maine is getting, is not expected, Maine is in the process of receiving 19 million in the bipartisan infrastructure law to expand electric vehicle charging. And this will be combined with another 8 million from Governor Janet Mills' Maine Jobs Recovery Plan to, again, to put in electric vehicle charging up and down the free up and down I-95 along the coastal routes connecting our cities so the people can realistically start driving electric vehicles. Um, the main jobs recovery plan approved by the legislature, uh, it is supposed to be investing close to a billion dollars from the federal American rescue plan. That is a lot of money. And that's what I'm saying. It's very important that we invest these monies. These are one-time monies, unprecedented, I think it's fair to say, but they have to be done smart I would feel terrible if five years from now, someone said, oh, that money wasn't spent well. This is, a, this is our chance. We need to do things like investing in broadband so in rural areas so people don't have to drive. You can have economic development without generating trip demands. Sorry to be a little jargon there. Without generating people, making people have to drive. These are things that we can do. Uh, we need to have more active transportation before we get health benefits. These are things we can do, but it has to be done thoughtfully and constructively, and it involves trade-offs, and it really involves everybody in the state of Maine coming together here. There is, everybody is going to, every, every, as everybody, we live in this together, we, we must solve this together. 
looking out for our lowest, those people who are least able to adapt or not able to take advantage. Not everybody can buy an electric vehicle. Not everybody has the resources to insulate their home and put in a, a, a heat pump. These are the things we need to do. And we have to make it possible for everybody to participate. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rubin, uh, for laying out the challenges really that we face. And I think just to reemphasize again that it's not a question of this being something that is way off in the future on the horizon. We're seeing the impacts of climate today. And that's really what I wanna to pivot to now is some more specific examples of how climate is impacting different industries uh, in the state. We're going to start actually first talking about the forestry industry. Uh, Pat Stroke is executive director of the Maine Forest Products Council. Uh, he has a deep background in the forestry and recycling industries, and he was also coordinator of the Maine Sustainable Forestry Initiative. Um, we're also going to hear from Rooney Q. She is the green program manager of the Inn by the Sea, and she has worked in hospitality for over two decades, and she served on the board of Visit Portland. She's been on the Maine Tourism Commission. She's also Greater Portland's regional representative at the Maine Office of Tourism. And finally, we're going to hear from Kurt Brown with Ready Seafood. Uh, Kurt advocates for Maine's lobstermen and for the lobster fishing industry. Uh, he has a unique background as both a lobsterman and a scientist. He has a master's degree in marine biology from the University of Maine. And so we'll end with, with Kurt and talking a little bit about where we might see things going uh, in the future. But let's begin first with Pat. Well, thank you, Rachel. It's great to be a part of this uh, seminar on economics and climate change. I'm I'm honored. Um, the council just briefly has about 300 members and we're involved in advocacy at the state and federal level. And we've been doing a lot of economic development work too. So we're at eight, eight plus billion dollar industry with about 33,000 jobs uh, contributing to the economy. I served on the governor's uh, climate change council, so I've had a lot of lots of discussions with uh, great people talking about the challenges and the opportunities in my industry. I'll offer a couple of quick perspectives from the um, point of view of uh, the landowners, um, loggers, and wood manufacturers. Um, but the climate council talked a lot about our industry with the concept of the uh, forest bioeconomy that's growing. And it's a way to look at uh, opportunities that uh, the future can bring when we look at the properties of wood. So as far as landowners are concerned, um, there are about, we have about 8 million uh, acres of dues paying members. So we, we talk about the industrial forest, but also the rest of Maine is Maine is 90% uh, forested, so we have um, uh, smaller landowners and quite a mix of various kinds of landowners. What we notice in our operations is that we certainly have a sharp, shorter harvesting season. Right now, um, believe it or not, we cut the majority of our wood during frozen ground conditions. We're able to increase capacity, move more equipment, um, and to and in frozen ground, it's an environmentally more stable kind of soil condition for us to cut wood. So you can imagine loggers and landowners and mills all are chomping at the bit a little bit to make sure they have enough supply of wood, but it's difficult. We don't make mud anymore. That's uh, an environmental imperative. And so our challenge is uh, trying to, to find equipment with more rotation because we have a shorter harvesting season. So we see a lot of interesting Scandinavian equipment and uh, bigger tires on machinery. I mean, the upside of this is that we have moderate temperatures, so our growing season perhaps is longer, but I think the balance is, um, is pretty severe right now. So we're trying to figure out how to move forward with a shorter harvesting season. The thing that probably concerns a lot of landowners more than anything is the northward migration of insects and diseases. Uh, it's perhaps our greatest threat. We're seeing 
balsamoli adelgia long hair beetle uh, long ear <laughs> beetles i'm getting mixed up with uh, uh bats but uh beetles are moving this way and uh and and it's wiping out species of trees so uh emerald ash borer is coming after our ash trees that's uh that's a serious concern and we need to think about how the species mix is going to be threatened how do we create more resilient forests so they can withstand uh, those kinds of pressures? Um, the other thing that you'll see in the climate action plan with regard to landowners is that we have opportunities in this arena to sell offset credits. The principle is that we know in Maine uh, about 60% that when we look at our forests, um, the Climate Council Scientific Advisory Committee um, estimated that our forests sequester about 60% of the emissions generated from petroleum. And then when we look at the wood products that embed carbon and in long lived um, products, another 15% of uh, emissions from petroleum products is contained. So in total, we have a uh, 75% of the emissions from petroleum products um, uh, are captured in our forests and in the products we produce. And that's a great advantage we have in Maine, a factor of so much forest land and uh, a low population. But other regions are envious of that and actually are interested in, um, in sharing some of that wealth that we have in carbon. Um, there are markets that are developing both a compliance market. You can sell your carbon credits on the, um, the compliance market like the California exchange, but a number of voluntary markets are uh, being established as well. Uh, big chains are interested in, um, in having emissions credits um, and they're doing deals with uh, landowners or potential deals. So a really interesting kind of uh, development that's taking place. Our wood manufacturers, uh, of course, offer this uh, uh, ability for durable wood products to be a um, uh, source of carbon storage. But we also have a, a market that's diversifying uh, in packaging materials. The push is to move away from plastics and to uh, diversify into packaging materials. We've always had paper cups, um, but you're seeing more, more and more packaging being built with uh, wood fiber. And I think that's gonna be a opportunity for us. When we look at some of the recent investments in Maine, we see um, SAPI, for instance, and uh, Nine Dragons all moving away from printing and writing papers, and they're diversifying into packaging and container board. Uh, we're certainly doing a lot more shipping of goods and we need boxes to do that. And this whole idea of moving into uh, eco-friendly packaging is uh, also important. The building trades, there's an increased emphasis on using wood over maybe other traditional uh, materials like concrete and steel. Louisiana Pacific is putting in new kinds of siding. So we are seeing an expansion based on that kind of market demand. Sawmills, uh, J.D. Irving, Pleasant River, they're looking carefully at their energy usage and putting in um, boilers and turbines to generate their own electricity as they heat waste wood for their kilns and their operations. Um, and we have Timber HP, which is uh, pushing more of an environmentally friendly wood fiber kind of uh, a product. Liquid fuels are coming online in many uh, areas. I think we have four groups that have announced uh, liquid fuel uh, opportunities. Ensign Fuel has been supplying Bates College with um, fuel for their um, heating plant. So it's real and it's happening. And biochar is a soil amendment. Uh, that facility is being built up in Enfield at the uh, Pleasant River facility sawmill there. And cross-laminated timbers, they're a rich source of uh, wood 
construction is uh, growing in demand as well. You're seeing structures throughout the state, and I think Bowdoin College has an amazing structure made with COT. So this whole idea of the forest bioeconomy is growing. Um, it's an opportunity for us as uh, citizens to support um, our forests, the health of them. There are certainly challenges, but also um, I think many places are looking to Maine to, to help uh, build this forest bioeconomy and take advantage of uh, opportunities. I tell my sawmillers, we no longer make two by fours, we make linear carbon building units. Um, and that's kind of the future. It's perhaps repackaging some of what we have done, but also looking at um, opportunities going forward. So those are some of my brief comments. Thank you very much, Pat. And you did such a great job too of hitting on the different points that Professor Rubin made in direct cost, adaptation cost, and uh, mitigation. So with that, let's switch over to the hospitality industry and Bruni Q. Hi, right. well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here to talk about climate change. Um, you know, the, uh, the industry in Maine, the hospitality industry in Maine is huge. It's connected to 160,000 jobs, which means that one in every six or one in every seven jobs is connected to uh, tourism and hospitality. So it's an economic driver for the state, but it's also globally responsible for 10 or 11 percent of the global GDP. So it's an enormous, enormous industry, and it can either have a positive effect or a negative effect on the environment. And uh, throughout history, it's had a little bit of both. Um, ever since World War II, people have, there have been voices saying tourism and hospitality has had negative impacts on the environment, on communities, and on cultural heritage. But if we balance that with the fact that tourism and hospitality has been responsible for preserving and protecting lots of fragile um, ecosystems, lots of open spaces, beaches, mountains, and cultural heritage as well, um, we really it kind of balances out but of course we do have an enormous impact on the environment and we really need to step up and do more we are told that our industry is responsible for about eight percent of the emissions that contribute to climate change but 50 percent of those are transportation um, jonathan mentioned the things that are in our plan in maine and i would really hope that better public transportation would be added to those lists because for instance at in by the sea maine is a very rural state we're in cape elizabeth there is no public transportation so 75 employees drive their individual cars to the inn and people tourists who come to maine all 25 to 35 million of them often come by car as well public transportation would be great to get staff to and from their jobs and better public transportation would also help tourists so um, right now the thing that um, i think our industry is doing to encourage tourism um, to limit transportation is we try and convince people that they should travel like a local. It's a very trendy thing right now. Come and stay for 10 days instead of taking 10 uh, three-day weekends to try and limit tra transportation. Um, so the, the thing about Maine tourism is that our natural environment is really what brings people to the state. It's our pristine beaches, the cold ocean waters that are really clean and wonderful, our, our mountains and our rivers. Um, this is all the magnet that drives people to want to come to Maine. So protecting the natural environment from the ravages of climate change is incredibly important. And yet our industry has been really slow to take up that call. Um, I think it was around 2006, 2008, when people finally began 
making changes. And this was partially caused by ad advances in technology and what was available. And also the realization that if hotels and restaurants reduced water waste and energy on their properties, um, they could also save money. And so around 2000, 2006, 2008, hotels started making changes. And um, <laughs> there was just this proliferation of certifications at that time as well. Practically overnight, we had 350 certifications for green hotels and um, green restaurants. Most of them have gone by the way, but some of them have survived. Um, the most popular hotel pro programs right now that reduce water waste and energy on property are the sheet and towel reuse program. It's been around for a long time. You're all aware of it, I'm sure. Um, it's not popular with guests, but it actually has a huge environmental impact in that obviously if you're not changing people's sheets or towels for two or even three days, you're saving 50 to 60% of energy for um, washing and drying, chemicals for the soap that goes into it, manpower, as well as water. So it actually is terrific for the environment, but not popular with guests. Um, Pumps in large amenities, uh, in amenities now, get, buying bulk amenities and putting product into the pumps saves thousands and thousands of small bottles from going into landfill. Um, it's very trendy right now, too, for restaurants and hotels to try and get rid of single-use plastic. Straws were the first target, and this was partly driven by legislation, but also it's partly driven by what tourists want. Um, people are getting rid of single-use plastics, getting rid of the plastic bottles, and in by the sea we have glass bottles that are rewashed, uh, put back into rooms with wonderful Sebago Lake tap water. We let guests know that's exactly what what it is, and no one complains. They're very happy to have it rather than the plastic bottles. Just in our tiny inn alone, that saves about 1,800 plastic bottles a month. Um, reductions in water have also been very popular over the last 10 years or so with low flow showers, aerators. Um, some people have put in dual flush toilets, that's just beginning, um, and low flow urinals. Um, also, not programs that are popular with guests, but really great for saving water. Um, some people have gone to ozonated laundry systems, which is terrific, like the Meadow Mare in uh, Wells. The other thing that has really been popular uh, saving energy has been CFLs to LED lighting, and that has really been adopted by most people in the industry. Um, the other things that are happening right now are some hotels and restaurants are adding the level two charging stations and composting food waste has been um, really on the uprise since we've had composters come into the greater Portland region and all over Maine. Uh, 20 years ago, In by the Sea started composting yard waste and food waste, um, but we were working with a farmer. When the farmer retired, we were able to work with uh, garbage to garden, which is terrific picking up right at, at the end. Uh, restaurants have had longstanding use of local produce. I don't think there's a chef in um, our wonderful restaurants in Portland that doesn't really think of local, 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 trying to um, create menus around seasonality and local food. This is terrific because it supports your uh, local communities and it also gives tourists that local experience that they're looking for. So local spirits, local beer, um, local seafood and seasonal is very trending. Um, the addition of plant-based menus is also really important right now. Vegan, vegetarian options um, are very popular and growing, and that's terrific for the environment as well as for our local um, vendors. Um, working with um, people like the Gulf of Maine Research um, and educating chefs around the warming waters 
sustainably harvested seafood, the difficulty in harvesting seafood, understanding how the Gulf of Maine is managed and how difficult it is for our fishermen to bring in local seafood um, for our restaurants is very important. And people have really changed the way they buy seafood, um, are trying to serve more seafood that is sustainably harvested and also abundant or in season than just putting something on the menu that is very difficult for our local fishermen to bring in. Um, there are really two ways that hospitality and tourism can make contributions to climate change, and that's really with design features. Um, in by the Sea went through a huge renovation in 2007, and it cost millions of dollars. We were able to get a LEED certification. We were able to recycle 70% of the construction waste. We put in solar panels, uh, recycled sheetrock walls, recycled cork floors, air-to-air um, -air heat exchangers, dual flush toilets. However, that can only happen in our industry when people are going through a huge renovation or making huge capital changes. The other things that hospitality can do and is doing Doing is to create programs, reaching out to community um, to assist people who are working on climate change, reaching out to the state. In by the Sea has been creating guest-centric, fun, and whimsical programs um, that are education, but also we hope help um, with climate change. Right now, we've been working with the state, the Department of Conservation and Fish and Wildlife on habitat restoration. Years ago, we started putting in plantings, native plants that were perfect for um, the habitat and uh, food resources for New England cottontails. Um, and now we're working with the state on reducing or eliminating, we hope someday, um, the invasive plants that have come into the state park. Japanese knotweed is taking over. So what we've done is we bring in a herd of goats to take down the Japanese knotweed. They love Japanese knotweed. Um, it's incredibly zen for our guests to go down and watch the goats taking out the invasive plants. We have uh, manager cocktail events where we bring in baby goats. The guests can love and hold and play with the goats. They become very interested in the programs around habitat restoration. We walk them down to uh, where the goats are taking out the Japanese knotweed, and it opens up a whole conversation around the impacts of climate change on our coastal communities, um, the degradation, which just happened with our last storm in Cape Elizabeth. We lost a couple of feet of sand dunes, of the sand dunes, and how important they are to act as a filter between the land and the ocean. So it's an educational moment. It's highly entertaining, but at the same time, we're working with the state on habitat restoration. So that that is, um, I hope that a lot of hospitality people will reach out to the state or to the partners in Maine and try and add some of these fun programming kinds of things that also are regenerative and help um, with habitat restoration as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rooney. And thank you also for explaining both the, the opportunity that comes with some of this adaptation and mitigation strategies, even though it costs money to do, um, and picking up on that connection between the relationship be of consumers and restaurants and so forth uh, with the fishermen and the seafood industry. Let's turn it over to Kurt and uh, hear a little bit more from his perspective. Kurt? Thank you, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, I'm humbled to be part of such an amazing group, and I'm just struck over the last half hour how connected everything here in Maine is. Um, Rooney, I saw the goats this morning, uh, sorry, this summer, brought our kids to Crescent Beach, and my oh my, what a wonderful learning experience that was. You guys have done such an amazing job with that. Uh, and with all the displays and all the markings and explaining why for my seven-year-old and my five-year-old, um, it was really probably one of the highlights of the entire summer. Um, when I was growing, my name is Kurt Brown, by the way, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I, I, I'm a lobsterman right out of Cape Elizabeth. So my background, a lot of the time when I'm harvesting is the beautiful Inn by the Sea, right behind Crescent Beach. 
Uh, I grew up lobstering in Cape Elizabeth. I started when I was about eight years old. I still fish about 500 traps off the coast of Cape Elizabeth to this day. Lobstering is what sparked my interest in marine biology. Um, University of Maine is where I got two master's degrees in their dual degree program, one in marine biology, one in marine policy. I worked at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute for about nine years and currently work as a marine biologist at Ready Seafood Company, which is a live and value-added lobster wholesale company based in both Portland and Saco. When I was a kid, my lobsters were sold to Alewife Brook Farm. Um, I fished with Jody Jordan and his family who run the farm as I was growing up, and there was always a spot in his holding tank for lobsters that were going to the Inn by the Sea. Yep. <laughs> so that that local aspect was certainly not lost on me during that wonderful overview that you gave about the hospitality industry. Maine's lobster industry does not exist without the hospitality industry. Um, additionally, I saw a lot of parallels with Pat's uh, amazing words. Um, storms are something that have been brought up over and over again, and storms are certainly something that impact what goes on out on the water and also the infrastructure that we rely on as an industry to do everything from unload our catch, moor our boats, tie up our boats, get fuel, uh, rising waters and storm frequency and intensity are certainly something that are front of mind, especially after the storm, not only the one we saw a couple of days ago, but especially the one we saw a couple of days before Christmas. Um, I, I, I took my kids to Fort Williams and Portland Headlight during that storm to see the waves rolling in. And um, this certainly isn't to pump our social media, but you can go on Ready Seafood's Instagram page and see three or four different videos of massive waves clobbering iconic Portland headlight and actually taking out a slab of asphalt and three windows got blown out, a door got blown out, and I've never seen that happen before. Um, it was it was truly amazing, really scary, and ultimately a harbinger of things to come in my mind. Um, the lobster industry is connected both directly and indir indirectly to the forest it's forestry industry. We have so much to learn from your industry, Pat, about utilizing everything. Um, the work that UMaine's uh, composite team has done uh, with cellulose and byproducts from uh, uh, forestry products is something that we need to work on as an industry, especially as processing lobster grows here in Maine. Um, shells obviously are a byproduct of processing lobster, and there's all kinds of great uses for the chitin and chitazan that is present in lobster shells. One of the great examples that we have, and it ties into this whole climate story, is the fact that a lot of our shells right now are going to a collaboration with the University of Maine where they're utilizing our lobster shells and incorporating them into the soil because lobster shells act as a great biopesticide, a great biofertilizer, and also help protect um, the potato plants or the potato farms that we're working with through UMaine on this project against disease. And as you heard Pat said, disease is something that, I mean, it's diseases and plants have always been around, but with climate change accelerating, it's certainly we're seeing new diseases and those are accelerating in both frequency and and uh, intensity as well. So that that wasn't supposed to be part of my talk, but I was just struck by how many connections there are just in this conversation alone and throughout all of Maine's, uh, not only natural resource-based industries, but all of our industries in general. Um, I was also on the, um, the, uh, the Governor's Climate Council on the Marine and Coastal Working Group. I am an industry uh, co-chair of uh, the Sea Maine project here in Maine, which is an economic accelerator for all of Marines industries, um, uh, bio-based uh, industries. And ultimately, when we talk about climate change in the Gulf of Maine, um, we're not just talking about individual species, whether it's lobsters, oysters, mussels, kelp, any number of the different industries we have because all of those species make up an ecosystem and everything is intertwined and we rely on a system that is functional. And as climate changes, 
um, that that ecosystem has the potential to change as well. Uh, we've seen that happen in Southern New England as far as lobsters go. And I'm guessing most of the folks on this call are familiar with the narrative around warming waters and lobsters moving north, um, especially north out of the Gulf of Maine. A lot of that narrative, um, and this isn't me here, uh, putting my head in the sand by any means, but a lot of that narrative has been driven, unfortunately, by a study out of Rutgers University that relied on um, National Marine Fisheries Service trawl survey data, which is a wonderful sampling method for fish, but it's not the greatest sampling method for lobster. It's done by the federal government up and down the East Coast every year and has been done for years at this point in time. And that study took Lobster data from the Federal Trawl Survey, which again, lobsters live under rocks. For the most part, that's the habitat that they prefer. Trawl surveys don't do well with rocky, ledgy bottoms, so it doesn't necessarily sample lobster habitat. Took the data from that trawl survey over time, threw it into a computer model, and basically said that 30 years ago, the center of the lobster population on the East Coast was off the coast of Long Island, New York. Today, the center of the population is along the coast of Maine, and that trajectory will just continue to uh, accelerate with climate change. Uh, Bill Halteman, at, uh, Dr. Bill Halteman at the University of Maine, uh, my statistics professor, uh, can certainly attest to the fact that I was not a wonderful statistics student but um, my most important statistics test was a straight face test. And the idea that 30 years ago, the center of the lobster population was off the coast of Maine just doesn't pass the straight face test. Um, so with that being said, I, I, I just wanted to get that out of the way and put that out there because that's a narrative that's driven a lot of public opinion around lobster. And many people expect that lobsters will continue to move north and be out of the Gulf of Maine in a relatively short period of time. That certainly isn't the case. And if you want to listen to a good podcast, I would suggest um, Bob Stenick, Dr. Box, Bob Stenick, who is also a, a, a UMaine professor, one of the, if not the foremost ecologists to study lobsters throughout history, joined, I believe it was Jennifer Rooks on Maine Calling. So if you just Google Bob Stenick, S-T-E-N-E-C-K and Maine calling that podcast will come up. He speaks at the end of it, but his words were pretty clear in that even under worst case scenarios under climate change, lobsters are still very within their thermal range here in the Gulf of Maine. And there's some dynamics there that I'll get into a minute in a minute. One side of the story where we have seen uh, impacts of climate change at a large detrimental scale is certainly in southern New England. South of Cape Cod, where the waters are certainly much warmer, we have seen a population collapse of lobsters down there. That's always been part of that narrative that lobsters are moving north is the depletion of the population in southern New England and that kind of working its way up the coast. I would just emphasize that here in Maine, we have some really common sense rules in place to protect our fishery. Um, such as a minimum size, a maximum size. Uh, Egg-bearing females go back into the ocean. Before those egg-bearing females go back, we're required to cut a V-notch into the tail flipper. That signifies she's a proven breeder. If those lobsters are caught again, even without eggs, they go back into the water. Other states only recently have adopted both the oversized rule and the protection of uh, V-notching, especially so states in Southern New England where the water was warmer and those populations were more vulnerable to climate change. So a big part of that story about depletion in Southern New England is temperature, no question about it, but it's also about the way those fisheries were managed. And that's a big part of it as well. If we zoom in on um, the Gulf of Maine generally and Maine specifically, um, one thing that isn't often talked about is the fact that at depths of below 30 or 40 feet, Western or Southern Maine actually has colder bottom temperatures than Eastern Maine. And that has everything to do with tidal mixing. In Eastern Maine, there is strong tides, big tides, the biggest in the world. And what those tides do, and especially in the spring, summer and fall is mix warmer surface water down to the bottom and colder, bottom water up to the top so that there is more of a consistent temperature pattern from surface to depth. In western Maine or southern Maine, we have more of a stratified system where surface water gets warmed in the spring, summer, and fall, 
and the tides aren't as big. So that warmer water stays near the surface and traps colder water below. And during the months between May and November, when we start to get bigger storms down in Southern Maine that mix that water up really well is at depth temperatures are three to four degrees colder than in Eastern Maine. Um, and so that's just uh, something to keep in mind as well. Why, why am I telling you all of this? Because Ready Seafood uh, is the largest lobster company in the country. We sell one species, lobster. We need to keep a finger on the pulse of what is going on with either the first or second most valuable species as fisheries go in the entire country. Maine's coastal economy uh, relies on the lobster fishery and all the other industries that um, on, on the land side of things rely on that uh, fishery as well. I mention this because my role at Ready Seafood as a marine biologist is working on projects in collaboration with the University of Maine, with Southern Maine Community College, with St. Joseph's College, with Bowdoin, with UNE, with Colby, with Bates, with everyone who will collaborate with us on, and we are fortunate to have such a great university and college system here <clears throat> in Maine. Um, and collaborate with them on research and monitoring programs that improves our understanding of not only the lobster resource, but the ecosystem overall. Our real flagship project is a collaboration with Dr. Rick Wally at the University of Maine, where we monitor lobster settlement. So cocktail party knowledge here. After a lobster hatches from an egg, they'll actually float up to the surface of the ocean and spend the first month of their life near the surface of the ocean going through four larval stages, after which they'll do test dives down to the bottom. And what they're doing is looking for suitable habitat. And when you're a lobster the size of a thumbnail, suitable habitat is anything you can hide under. So we work with the team at UMaine set what we call baby lobster collectors up and down the coast. They're, only, they're just cages full of rocks, essentially, the habitat that those little lobsters are looking for. Uh, we set them out every June at the beginning of hatching season. We come back and haul them every October at the end of uh, hatching and settlement season. And we see year in and year out what is there for what we call young of the year lobsters, essentially baby lobsters, how that early life stage of the lobster population is doing. This has been a project that was funded initially by Sea Grant. We took over funding as a company after two years, became the first private company to fund public lobster research. Today, this project is a co collaboration between harvesters. We actually get support from the Cranberry Isles Fishermen's Co-op up off of Acadia National Park, a real innovative co-op. Um, along Maine's coast. We fund a third of the project and Red Lobster Restaurant Group, believe it or not, actually helps fund a third of the project as well. You can go on their homepage, scroll down to the bottom of it and see three different commercials we made for them. The one titled Sustaining Maine Lobster is all about this research. So why does a private company fund public lobster research? Because of everything we're talking about today. Essentially, we want to know what is going on out in the ecosystem and that information on that early life stage dovetails, dovetails very well with other monitoring programs that Maine DMR is doing at different life stages of the lobster life cycle. So we can really keep a finger on the pulse of what is going on out there in the water. Like I said, it has everything to do with lobster, but it has everything to do with the ecosystem. What lobsters are eating? How is temperature changing their diet? What is eating lobster? Warmer waters bring new predators. And when we have warm summers like 2012, 2013, 2016, we see a heck of a lot more black sea bass, tatog, triggerfish, other warmer water species that love to eat juvenile lobsters. So it's that type of monitoring that is key to our industry. And as we continue to see the impacts of climate change. And this is what a big part of the discussion on the Marine and Coastal Working Group was, was how do we reduce our impact on the ecosystem as far as greenhouse gases go? As soon as someone figures out how to drop an electric engine into a lobster boat and provide charging stations, I always said, all you need to do is drop one of those engines into a lobster boat and let one person blow everyone off the line at one of the lobster boat races up and down the coast, and there will be a run on sales on those engines. 
That technology isn't there yet, but technology for electric trucks certainly is. And we're working very closely with a lot of companies on technology for tractor trailers, uh, electric technology or hybrid technology. We have a fleet of trucks that goes up the coast every day to source supply. We have a fleet of trucks that goes to Logan, JFK and Newark Airport every day. And if we could incorporate an electric or hybrid fleet into that, that would certainly go a long ways towards reducing our emissions. Um, I say all of this because we understand as a company and as an industry what is happening currently and what is going to happen going forward. And if we are going to survive as an industry, we need to keep our finger on the pulse of what's going on out in the ocean. That's ecological research and that's more of it. And I think that would be my emphasis. And what we need to do more as an industry is continue and improve our monitoring so we can um, improve our understanding of what's going on out there. I know I'm at time and I apologize for rambling, but I just get super excited about this. And I love all the connections that were on this call today. And I, I really appreciate the time. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kurt, and and thank you for for doing part of my job for me, which is bringing together some of the conversation up to this point. You know, I think as um, as we consider this topic going forward, this whole notion of the ecosystem, and we think about that both in a biological sense of like the, the the actual sort of biological environment and ecosystem from plants and animals and people and the natural environment, but it's also the economic ecosystem of the state as well and how all of the different industries interact with each other and provide potential solutions. Um, at this point, we do have a couple of minutes left. So if anyone does have a question you'd like to ask any of the panelists or Professor Rubin, uh, please enter that into the chat function now. I think um, I'll start with just one question in the in the interim here. Um, to take it back, uh, Jonathan, you know, after hearing what everyone on the panel described under your three types of cost, you know, direct cost, um, adaptation cost, and mitigation cost, it sounds like all of these are things that are, are being experienced today within these three industries and within Maine's economy. I don't know if you had any additional reflections on that that you wanted to share. Well, I think it's great, first of all, that I'm, I'm really proud of our Maine businesses. I mean, this is this is where our sort of spunkiness and being, we can do this in Maine. And so I really think that's important. It's a spirit of we can do this. So I think that's really important. And that ecosystem, the economic ecosystem, it is, uh, as as Kurt was explaining, okay, maybe today we can't swap out that electric uh, m m engine for uh, in a uh, lobster boat, but you can reduce the emissions on the hauling to market. So that's the creativity that we need so that we can do this in the way that makes a lot of sense, uh, look cost effectively. And I love the fact that the hospitality industry is thinking ahead and trying to find the value added and it's not just a negative, it's value added to the local conditions. I think that's amazing. Um, so that's what we need to do. Uh, but we just have to just everybody, it's 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 a mindset that we can do this. And that's that's part of it. It's an attitude. Rachel, just, yeah, yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go go for it. I was just going to say it has. It, I, I think the most success we'll have is if it's framed in that win-win scenario where businesses can see the benefit of being an early adopter of some of these new technologies. And that's really where followers will get involved, rewarding industry leaders and early adopters and showing how this can not only affect your business, but benefit your business. Well, Rachel, I, I can't think of a more encouraging, fascinating, informative uh, program that our two organizations were able to provide for our viewers today. Um, Dr. Rubin set the stage very well, and our panelists hit it out of the park. It was just an incredible show of, of strength, uh, not only in terms of managing the challenge, but in terms of finding those opportunities that we all hope uh, can be the case. And boy, I so thank you all so much. Uh, both of us are so impressed with what you had to say today and the words of encouragement that came from all of you. Um, and frankly, Rachel, I think we both look forward to the, to the next two episodes um, because 
It clearly is an issue that the state of Maine, its business community is taken very, very seriously. With that, we thank you all and look forward to the next program and hope you will join us. We'll be back to you as to when that will be and who the guests will be. Until then, take care and thanks again.